welcome to the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief, or ESSER, Roundtable Discussions. My name is Tracy Humbrecht, and I am the District ESSER Data Support Coordinator. The ESSER Roundtable Discussions are a four-part series of 20 to 30-minute conversations with some of the CCS personnel that helped us all navigate through the COVID-19 school closure, adjust to remote teaching and learning, and how we, as a district, have responded, prepared, and supported our students, families, and staff during the worldwide pandemic. To get us started, we have with us today Latrice Griffin, Chief of Communications, and Jacqueline Bryant, Executive Director of Communications. Thank you, ladies, for taking time out of your jam-packed schedule to share with us about ESSER and its impact on the communications side of our district. Um, Latrice, welcome. Thank you. Um, would you please start us off with a brief introduction of what the communications department does and how your department supports teaching and learning? Yes, so the goal of the communications department is to support the district in effectively communicating its initiatives, programming, et cetera. Um, how we support teaching and learning is we utilize effective data-driven strategies to make sure that we're building, forging strong relationships with our parents, students, staff, both those internal and external stakeholders. Jacqueline, um, I know you were here when the shutdown first occurred, mm -hmm. like many of us. Um, what went through your mind on March 13th, 2019, let's go back uh, a couple of years, and Governor DeWine comes on TV and he orders a shutdown of all of the schools in Ohio. Uh, so take I us think, back to that moment. I think we, we all knew that something was going to be happening um, throughout the week, mm -hmm. and um, people had been taking things home and preparing for... Uh, what inevitably was the shutdown of uh, or shuttering of the school buildings for a time. So uh, when it did come, people were just like, okay, go home, grab your stuff, um, and then we'll uh, be in touch with you on next steps. So it was kind of like a uh, uh, a moment where time stood still, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if that makes sense. And um, But we had to quickly pivot because, you know, Next week was um, remote, mm -hmm. and we had to figure out how we were going to do that, what we were going to do, how were we going to communicate with the parents. So it was just a, a ball of confusion for a quick moment, but then not enough time to really think about it and to act. I, I remember quite well uh, my supervisor coming in and telling us, get your things, go home, mm -hmm. and uh, not knowing how long we were going to be gone and trying to you didn't even know what to grab to, to right. take with you. I, re I remember that. Um, so if both of you, whoever would like to answer this question, could you help us understand how um, the communication department specifically responded, prepared, and supported remote learning for the long term? Well, and I'll have Jackie piggyback on this, but the overall purpose was to ensure that everyone had the information that they needed. That was the charge of the communications department. So whether that was, as Jackie mentioned, about remote learning, um, what was open, what was not, um, health protocols, et cetera. It was our department's job to get that information out, to get it out quickly, to make sure that it was factual and up-to-date um, because things were ever-changing. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we were up-to-date up on all of that. So during that time, much of our communication efforts were trial and error as we tried to figure out how best to spread the scale about our messaging. Um, two errors that we realized were critical were internal communications and then our multilingual translations. We had to learn how to operate in a remote environment, which included uh, a crash course in uh, facilitating live Zoom board meetings um, and other meetings in general, because Zoom at that time was just very new. Mm -hmm. So um, as part of that, uh, communications was very critical um, to everyone to ensure that everyone had the correct information. So that included stakeholders, teachers, staff, family, students, and the community. Um, we had to use multiple communication methods and channels to reach all the stakeholders. And we supported many different programs and efforts to help students with remote learning, whether it was Chromebook distribution, Wi-Fi service and hotspot distribution, meal sites, uh, return to work information for staff, athletics, uh, virtual graduation ceremonies. You know, all that stuff that we had to think about um, vaccine administration in partnership with the city, building signage for health and safety measures, COVID notifications every mm -hmm. few days. Um, and then uh, we also put in place a family needs survey. So there, was a, there were a lot of different um, 
avenues um, that we had to uh, be able to navigate in order to get information out. My nephew graduated in 2020, so he was that group mm -hmm. that um, finished his senior year remotely and mm -hmm. um, trying to help him with, with you know, getting everything done and learning it myself right. <laughs> to support our teachers as well. I, I remember just how stressed everybody was. Um, and it was a stressful time because, mm -hmm. you know, we're at home and uh, working remotely, people want to say, oh, I love to work remote. <laughs> but I, for me, I found the drawback was um, people had access to you 24 hours mm -hmm. a day. Yeah. And you're, you, were, you always felt like you were on call. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the minute you heard that ding, you were up and you're looking at your laptop or your watch or, or what have you. So it was, a, it was exhausting um, as well as um, stressful. Yeah. yeah. Especially those, those early months, mm -hmm. yeah, when we were all still Definitely. trying to figure it out. So we did an entire school year remote. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I felt like we finally got the Zoom figured out. We finally realized where the mute button was and, you know, right. all of those those little idiosyncrasies that come with that. And then we transitioned into hybrid teaching, which, again, is another pedagogy that we did not have. Um, so if you could just take us back in your opinion, what procedures, systems, and structures needed to be changed to go from that remote to the hybrid? So in my opinion, there wasn't so much a change in how we communicated. It was making sure that everyone had the information that they needed because students weren't at school every day because they were hybrid. So it wasn't as simple as, you know, send this letter home with, with, the, with the child. Mm -hmm. So making sure internal and external stakeholders had the accurate information of what their bill schedule was, you know, which day they were supposed to be there, um, what materials they needed, et cetera. And, and, and to go along with that, you know, we had to be nimble with our communication efforts. Mm -hmm. um, we had to anticipate what was coming around the corner. Yeah. Um, also react in the moment to communicate effectively. Um, we also had to collaborate and align with other departments to ensure that messaging was clear and effective. Mm -hmm so as not to affect the teaching and learning that was happening in the schools at the time because we were in that hybrid mode. Mm -hmm. And the PPE, we're going to be talking in later episodes to our um, operations side of, of how that PPE got distributed and everything. But I, you know, I remember our custodians having to come in and, and clear out furniture everywhere, not just classrooms, but everywhere and trying to get those schedulings done again. It was something that just was changing every single day. Um, so how did those changes impact the way you and in, in communication supported teaching and learning? Well, a couple of ways we had to look at our internal communication. So we resurrected an internal staff email newsletter to ensure employees had a consistent and reliable venue to get information. We redesigned the staff intranet, um, moving from an archaic system in Lotus Notes to a more modern site in Microsoft SharePoint. Mm -hmm. um, this new site allowed us... Um, allow staff the ability to access the internet remotely and get information quickly. Mm -hmm. um, for our website, we created a hub on our external website as, one, as a one-stop portal for all necessary information for families. Um, multilingual communications, we had to collaborate with our ESL team to ensure timely and accurate uh, translations of important messaging when it came to school, um, what was next, athletics, um, and this included auto dialers, flyers, uh, emails, and website copy. So um, th those were the biggest ones. And then in terms of our multimedia services, uh, we utilized the video conferencing, live streaming, um, informational videos became very important very quickly. I remember the first board meeting we had to do, you know, uh, uh, streaming. It, it, was, it felt like you were um, disconnected, but you were still able to... Mm -hmm to get the business of the day mm -hmm. um, done and, and communicated mm -hmm. and provide that um, informational connection to the community. Yeah, and I know the YouTube channel b came out of that, right? Mm -hmm. the, because of the board meetings and the different um, 
types of meetings that we had to stream. Well, I think we, we always had the YouTube as, as part of our access, mm -hmm. um, but it just we just became more reliant mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um, providing that video content. Mm -hmm. And people realized it was there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think we also had to, you know, partnerships were very big. We had to closely work with our communication teams of partner organizations, um, such as the City of Columbus, Nationwide Children's Hospital, the Department of Health, mm -hmm. and other local mm -hmm. nonprofits to make sure yeah. that uh, we were all on the same on page the same when it page, came right. to communicating. Yeah. So you actually answered my next question mm -hmm. was how to ensure the least amount of disruption. And those stakeholders, I think, you know, we cannot um, over over appreciate just mm -hmm. how much those external stakeholders truly helped us. I mean, I remember um, got, um, got Mayor Ginther coming in and, and helping um, – us make sure that we had Chromebooks mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, and I know that we had a lot of partnerships come in during that time of our community business partners helping with hot spots and um, the um, rec centers mm -hmm. that opened up um, that gave the students a place to go to get help. Um, when when they couldn't get to their teachers. So right. um, we, d we did a lot of um, truly out of the box thinking um, to find solutions to a very unique issue. Um, or you had to. You had to yeah. be able to pivot quickly because mm -hmm. we'd never been through something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. before. And when you think about your families and mm -hmm. um, not realizing that not everybody had Internet access and then trying to provide that, that access to those students and families. Um, it, 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 was, it, it was a time where you just had to make sure you really reached out and connected. Yeah, if we learned anything, it, it really showed a true sense of community. Mm -hmm. Because as you yeah. said, all of those external stakeholders, stakeholders came together to say, these are the services that I can offer and provide so that we can support our students and families. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say, speaking to one of my other friends whose um, children went to non-public schools, they, they really it wasn't such a big transition for them because they were already one-to-one. -one. They already mm -hmm. had all of these other things in place. And one thing that I will say, it, I think people realize the inequities, not just in our district, but in all pub, you know, public K-12 education mm -hmm. is severely underfunded. Mm -hmm. And I think the pandemic really highlighted that nationwide. Absolutely. You know, you saw, you saw nationwide children sitting, you know, in front of a McDonald's to get Wi-Fi mm -hmm. <laughs> or going to school. We had, mm -hmm. you know, families driving to the parking lots of our schools to get mm -hmm. to the Wi-Fi until we could get them hot spots. So um, I think if, if I can say anything good came out of it, I think that public awareness, mm -hmm. when you hear us say, we, we need this, we need this, we need this, and mm -hmm. people saw it definitely in real time. Right. Um, so how did ESSER funding impact uh, the communications department capacity and the strategies to support student achievement? I mean, we talked a little bit about some of that, the Zooming and the YouTube channel and just different strategies and the trial and the air. But was there anything that looking back at it, you're saying, wow, you know, because of this, we really have built our capacity um, to maybe even make some permanent changes that have helped strengthen the way we communicate with um, internal and external stakeholders. Well, that ties into our multimedia services and what we offer because that department really grew and became very robust because of the needs that COVID showed us that were taking place. So we didn't do as many video messages before. We didn't do as much streaming and live conferencing. But now we didn't put those things away once the pandemic, mm -hmm. quote unquote, ended. Mm -hmm. So we're able to realize that, OK, this was a permanent change that, you know, is a great, effective way to communicate with the public and with our internal staff that we're going to keep doing mm -hmm. because we're seeing that people are more engaged with that video content. People are more engaged with things that they can actually um, see and access when it's best for them. Um, and I would like to just end with um, just sharing with us the impact um, that you feel was made because of our ESSER funding. And I, and I know, you know, the le part of that levy pr um, promise was that we were really trying to sustain 
some of the the great things that did come from that ESSER funding um, that we do want to keep. So when you're thinking about long term, the communications department and the impact, um, what are some some of those things that you see for sustainability um, to really help us continue with the way we communicate with our stakeholders um, and just the way that the department has grown because of the ESSER funding? Well, for me, and you can t chime in, Jackie, it's about transparency and openness and making sure that whatever avenue or stream that we use, that's our core value that we're trying to do. So whether it is website updates or if it's social media um, graphics or if it's uh, live streaming, whatever that is, we want to make sure that we're using a, a multiplicity of channels to make sure that the public and our internal staff as well and parents have access. So, you know, we don't just utilize one channel and say, well, we put it out there, mm -hmm. you know, um, because still they may not have internet access they may you know that may be limited for them so making sure that we're utilizing every channel that we possibly can to make sure that we're communicating well and you know we're staying nimble i think she hit the nail <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, and we haven't stopped being stressed out i mean it's right. constant yeah. it's constant thing uh, I my supervisor always says over communication is better than under communication. So, Absolutely, um, and I've taken that to heart. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, it's it's not good enough to just say, "Well, I emailed it," or it right. was in a newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It needs to be repeated multiple ways, different you know, different languages. We have our five most yep. spoken languages in the district, mm -hmm. and and that's changing a little mm -hmm. bit too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, we have to start refocusing on that as well. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, think about how many times have you missed an email. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so if you have those multiple touch points, then, you know, you're increasing the chance that your message is going to break through. Well, hopefully with this um, ESSER roundtable discussions that we have, uh, we're going to be hopefully giving another touch point of how this district used our ESSER money at the impact that it made, um, not only for our students and teachers, but our community at large as well. Um, we know that those students that for three years were impacted by ESSER, whether it was remote learning, um, hybrid learning, coming back to our quote unquote normal, right. return to normal, um, you know, those students are going to matriculate into uh, tax paying citizens, right? Mm -hmm. So with a, with a very uh, unique history in their education, a, a very unique spot. Um, and I know they at the time said this is a once in a century a uh, thing that happens, I hope they're right, because I don't right. want to go through it again. <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, know right? yeah. I, I mean, we look back on it and go, yes, we learned, we learned. Mm -hmm. I don't it need to repeat, right? It was a tough lesson. It, it was, was a tough, was a tough lesson, lesson. Yes, was absolutely. Yes. Well, ladies, thank you so much for your time and effort uh, here this morning. And I know it's always hard being the first one, but I think this is a great jumping point, uh, starting point for our ESSER roundtable discussions. And we know that your schedules are very tightly packed so thank you so much for making the time to speak to us today about our lessons learned during ESSER. You're Thanks very welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you.